praise the Lord tonight. We well, thank God for the Bible study and we well, thank you for being here. And our newcomers who are here, I really appreciate that you are here. And all the old timers have not seen your faces directly like this for a long time. Welcome. Yes. Say welcome to your pastor. Yes. The Lord bless everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for our brothers and sisters. Thank you for our newcomers. Thank you for all who are listening everywhere. We're asking the Lord that tonight will be a time of divine touch in every life in Jesus' name. Our spirit, our soul, our body, our mind, our families, will receive a definite second touch tonight in Jesus' name. As we have always done, because we have not changed, do it again. Transform the lives of everyone. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see down in the blessing of the Lord. We are coming to Mark chapter 8 tonight. And I'm reading from verse 22. Tonight, we'll be studying from verse 22 all through to verse 33. Mark chapter 8, reading from verse 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and he bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had speech on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again, upon his eyes and made him to look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly that's what i've read to you now is unique and it's only mark that has recorded this miracle you have the opening of the eyes of the blind in matthew mark luke and john and you have it in all these Gospels. But this particular incident that the Lord had to touch him the second time was recorded only by Mark. And it's symbolic. It's unique. And it is what happens not only to the man that had the eyesight restored fully after the second touch, in our spirit, that's what God does. In our soul, that's what God does. That he touches us, we're saved. And not every problem concerning sin has been resolved because of that false touch. And he will ask us, is there any difference? Yes, there's a difference. There's an evidence that the Lord has touched me, has transformed me. But things can be better. That's why we go back to him the second time for his second touch. And he sanctifies us. You'll find that even in our receiving knowledge of the Lord, we go to him, he reveals Christ unto us. And he asks us, who is Jesus? What do you think of Jesus? And we tell him, this is what we know. And yet we go to him another time for a second touch, second illumination. And he opens our eyes again and we see very clearly, it happened to the disciples, that Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? And he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blood, flesh, human beings have not revealed this unto you but my father who is in heaven. And then as they went on again spiritually, he touched them again 
And then they said, now we know that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I thought they knew before. That was the first touch. And then, after you had touched them and touched them and touched them, the word of God, he said, you know things now better than the Pharisees, better than all the people around, and yet you don't know everything. He says, I'm going to send the comforter, and that comforter will replace me, and he will teach you all things. They knew it before, but now a new touch will come. As you look at your life as a Christian, you're going to find out he touched me before. And if you thought everything is now over because he touched me first, that for the first time, you're mistaken. You go back to him and then he touches you. He opens the eyes of the blind. And he opens the mind of his own disciples. And when he was here on earth, before he got to the cross, he was teaching them and he was enlightening them and they had illumination and they knew that this is the Christ. And then he died. He was buried. He rose again. After rising again, the disciples were shut up in a building. And then he came to them and said, Peace be unto you. And then we're told, and he opened their eyes of their mind that they might understand the scriptures. Before he died, he gave them the first touch. After he rose again, he gave them the second touch. That's why you are here tonight. He has touched you before, he will touch you again. He has healed you before, he will heal you again. He has saved you before, he will sanctify you. He has done the first touch and the first transformation. And a second one is coming today. Amen. You will not go back home the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, I'm looking at this study on the necessity of the second touch. The necessity of the second touch. Don't think that only one touch is enough. It's touched us before. It will touch us again. The necessity of the second touch. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, complete recovery after the second touch. Complete recovery after the second touch. Point number two, a convincing revelation of spiritual truth. When the Lord asked them, do you know me? What do the people of the world, what do they say about me? Some said you are one of the prophets that lay before. Some said you are this and some said you are that. And he asked them, who do you say that I am? And then Peter speaking for the rest said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It was revelation from heaven, a convincing revelation of spiritual truth. But then, before the story ends, he began to tell them what will happen to him. That he will die and he will be buried. And then he rises again the third day. And Peter took him up and said, that will never happen to you. And Jesus said, get me behind me, Satan. Because you do not know. Hold on. He knew, so he confessed. And he gave a convincing revelation of spiritual truth. And now something was revealed. And he didn't understand. And he opposed. And he contradicted. And he needed another touch spiritually. So that now his mind will be like the mind of Christ. His will will be like the will of Christ. His understanding will be like the understanding of Christ. He needed another touch. Point number three, a clear reminder. Need for the second transformation. What happened to Peter is a clear reminder that he needed a second transformation and it's a clear reminder to you and to me. We need the second transformation. Point number three, a clear reminder need for the second transformation. Let's come back to point number one. Complete recovery after the second touch. We're coming to Mark chapter eight. 
And I'm reading from verse 22. Mark 8, verse 22. It's a straightforward story. It says, and he comment to Bethsaida, and he bring a blind man unto him, and he besought him to touch him. They besought Christ to touch him. If you need a miracle, you have to come to Christ. If your neighbor needs a miracle, you have to bring your neighbor to Christ. And if somebody very close to you, you cannot help him. He's blind. Even if he was born blind, with God, all things are possible. And whatever your challenge tonight, whatever your situation tonight, God is able. Christ is able. He will solve every problem. But you see, we must come to the Lord. That means as we listen to the teaching of the word of God, you will not go back home before the final amen. You will wait. If you are listening to the word of God and the word of God reveals somebody, something has to happen to you. When we say, now let us rise up and pray, that's not the time to go out. That's not the time to visit him, whatever or wherever. You will wait on the final amen and when that final amen happens, something must happen in your life. And so they brought this man to Christ and he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the town how about that he took that blind man and he removed him from the midst of the people who are blind spiritually from the midst of the people who have the blindness of unbelief and the blindness of doubting and the blindness of contradiction and the blindness of causing confusion in the mind of the man he took him away so that he can be with the blind man all alone by himself. When you come in contact with Christ and then you block out the world, you block out your own pastors and you block out the unbelief of other people, here is Christ, here is the blind man, here is Christ and here you are, here is Christ and here is the needy one. When there is nobody between you and Christ, something will happen. An explosion of God's power, a communication of God's power, a transmission of God's power will come into your life. He took him out of the town. And when he had speech on his eyes, think about that. When he had speech on his eyes, the, the scriptures reveal what Christ has done. You see, many people, they don't understand. They say, I don't understand that one. How could something like that happen? You know that the spittle, that is your saliva, is very, very useful. And Christ knew that. And Christ knew that the saliva, even of the ordinary, have you noticed when something happens? When you mistakenly burn your finger, Maybe something hot like an ant touches your finger. Without even thinking at all, you put that finger in your mouth. What are, why are you doing that? Because the saliva will soothe that pain. Or sometimes you are trying to cut something and then you cut your finger suddenly. And the natural thing you do, without even thinking about it, when, without anybody telling you, you quickly put that finger in the mouth. Because of the soothing effect of that sputum. And the soothing effect of that saliva. And of course, everything about Jesus has power. His garment has power. His look has power. His word has power. His saliva has power. Everything about Jesus carries divine power. And whatever Jesus decides to use, his garment, his word, his touch, his saliva, or whatever, a miracle must happen in your life. And so he put his hands after that upon him and he asked him if he saw aught. He did that for the first time. He touched him for the first time and he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. He said, I see what I didn't see before. Because now I can see people moving, but I can't see them clearly. I see them like trees walking. I know trees don't walk from what I've learned. But since they are moving, 
Even though they look like trees, they must be men. We learn a lesson here. After God has done something in your life, a great miracle in your life, you will not say, it's even better than it was before. And so what else do I need? That's enough for me. And then you run away. Wait, there is more coming your way. And there are times when people come to the Lord for the first time. The Lord touches them. They're saved. They're born again. There's peace in their heart. There's joy in their soul. And then they say, praise the Lord. I'm going to where I came from because now I have got it. You've got it, but you've not got everything. Come back again. Something new will happen. And something great will happen. And so in verse 25, after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes. A repetition of the miracle. A renewal of the miracle. A second touch coming upon your life. It will happen tonight. And after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man. Tell me. Tell me out aloud. Yes. The second touch brought a clearer vision, a greater vision. The Lord is still working miracles today. We're told in Psalm 146, Psalm 146, I'm reading here from verse 8. Psalm 146, and we're reading from verse 8. You see what the Lord can do? It says the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. He may do it once, and then you see men as trees walking. You wait, you allow him to touch you the second time, and you will see everything clearly in Jesus' name. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. And then we come to Psalm 138, Psalm 138. I'm reading from verse 8. 138, verse 8. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth you. If you allow him to touch you the second time, if you don't run away after the first touch, is still going to do something and he will perfect your miracle in Jesus' name. If he has provided for you and that's not enough, he will provide again. If he has raised you up and you are not up enough, he will raise you higher again. And if he has done something for the first time and that first touch, that first miracle, that first transformation is not enough. And you only see dimly in second touch, a new transformation is coming your way. He will perfect that which concerns you. Thy mercy, O Lord, endure it forever. Forsake not the works of thine hand. He will not forsake you in Jesus' name. Come to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Why did Jesus touch him the second time? And why didn't he say, okay, you see, blimly now, you can go back home and uh, things will improve? Because, you know, there are people that say, once you pray for the first time on anything, if you pray for the second time, they say that's unbelief. They say, once you pray, you must not repeat the prayer. You must not pray again. You must just believe that God has done it, even if you're only seeing dimly. And even if you are seeing a man as trees walking, they say, if you pray for the second time, that is some belief. Jesus didn't teach that. He saw that the man had not got everything at the first touch, and so he said, I will touch you again. And he's telling you tonight, I will touch you again. He will touch you again in Jesus' name. Look at Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing. I'm confident tonight of your second touch. 
I'm confident tonight of your repeated miracle. I'm confident tonight that you will perfect that which concerns you in Jesus' name. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Better things are waiting you. Greater things are waiting you. Brighter future are waiting you. He will perfect it in your life in Jesus' name. But you know, I told you that this story is symbolic. That means that what Jesus did in the physical is about to do it in the spiritual. And let's come to Isaiah chapter 42 and see what the Lord himself is saying about the first touch for the blind and the second touch for the blind until your sight, until your vision, until your understanding, until your illumination is perfected. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 42. And I'm reading from verse 18. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 18. Hear ye deaf, and, and look ye blind, that she may see. You wonder, as a God was talking to the people, he said, you are deaf, hear. He said, you are blind, see. What did he mean? What was he referring to? And who was he really talking to when he said he wanted the dead to open their ears and to hear? And he wanted the blind to look up and to see. Look at verse 19. Verse 19, who is blind? But my servant, who is blind, but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I send, who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant. You see the story of the blind that Jesus touched and healed the first time, and then a second touch and a clearer vision is symbolic for the child of God. It's symbolic for the servant of God. That's why God himself said, Who is blind but my servant? And who is deaf but my messenger? Who is blind but the one that I have sent, the Lord's servant? Look at verse 20. Seeing many things, but thou observest not, opening the ears, but he heareth not. The time is come that every child of God will receive that second touch. Yeah. Every servant of God will receive that second touch. It will open our eyes again. Yeah. It will give us a new vision again. And whatever we have got before, we are going to get more. Yeah. And things are going to become clearer in your sight. In your mind, yeah. in your understanding, yeah. in your focus on the Lord will become clearer in Jesus' name. Yeah. I come to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, I'm reading now from verse 31. Luke chapter 24, verse 31. These are two believers on the way to Emmaus. And Jesus joined them and they saw him. No doubt. They saw him. And he did as if he was going away. He was going to pass them by. They said, why don't you stay? Why don't you wait? So that you'll pass the night with us. He was risen from the dead now. But they didn't recognize. Although they saw, they didn't see Jesus clearly. Look at verse 31. Luke chapter 24 verse 31. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight and they said one to another did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures he had opened the scriptures to them and they just saw him as a teacher he had opened the scriptures to them and they just saw him as somebody having great understanding and their hearts burnt in them. It was a great experience they had until he sat down with them 
and then he broke the bread and he gave it to them a second touch came that's what i'm telling you tonight a second touch must come to you you know sometimes as believers children of god we read a bible in a morning devotion and while we read that bible a light comes and shines on the word of god and we say lord thank you i see what i never saw before i understand what i've never understood before i can see the picture of jesus here this is my savior and this is my lord and then you pray and you praise the lord and worship him then another day you come to that same scripture and the holy ghost comes upon the scripture and illuminates the scripture and widens the scripture you say what i never saw this in this passage before and i studied this passage and i knew this passage that's your second touch you see, when people think that they know the word of God and they think that they've got the first touch and everything is over, everything is not over. Go back to that same word of God. He will talk to you again. He will reach out to you again. He will touch your eyes again and light will come and there will be a brighter understanding of the word of God in Jesus' name. He touched you before and is now about to give you the second touch. It's coming. I said it's coming. I, I want you to look at verse 45. Here are his disciples now. Those disciples that knew him. And he asked them, who do you mean say I am? They said you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Look at this now in verse 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Disciples, children of God, following after the Lord. He had opened their eyes before. He had opened the scriptures to them before. And they knew that all things written concerning him must be fulfilled. But now he opened the scriptures to them again the second time. It will come. I said, for you, it will come. You see, some Christians, they become stale. They become so-so Christians, superficial Christians. You know why? Because the one touch he gave them many years ago, that's what they're still testifying about. The one touch he gave them some time ago, praise the Lord, he touched me. Praise the Lord, he forgave me. Praise the Lord, he quickened me. Praise the Lord, I'm born again. And they do not understand there is still a second touch. In your life tonight, you will move up. In your, in your life tonight, you will grow up. There will be a second touch, a second transformation, a second illumination, a second miracle, a second turning around in your life tonight in Jesus' name. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 18. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Some people don't know that our hearts have eyes. Our mind has eyes. They think the only eyes we have are the physical eyes with which we see. And then when the Lord says, I want to touch the blind, I want to open the eyes of the blind, they say, okay, I'm looking for, is anybody blind there? They do not know that they themselves, that the eyes of their understanding are blind, are dim, and they cannot see very well. Now you know the Lord is going to touch your eyes. Look at verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that she may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what's the exceeding greatness of his power to us what who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Where is the mighty power going to walk tonight? In your heart, in your life, in your mind, in your body, that mighty power will work tonight in Jesus' name. 
And you understand now why we pray this prayer? We're coming to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Many people don't understand. Sometimes we say the prayer in singing. And sometimes we say it directly to the Lord. We open the Bible before we study, before we read. We utter this before the Lord. Look at Psalm 119. I'm reading from verse 18. Open mine eyes, open that mine eyes, that I may behold, tell me, say it aloud, say it aloud, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And hey, look up here, that's why you have brother A, brother B, brother C, sister A, sister B, sister C. They reach the same scripture. They reach the same passage. And brother A did not see what brother B is seeing. And brother B does not see what brother C is seeing. And sister A cannot imagine what sister B is talking about that he saw in that passage. And sister C is coming up with bright vision of glory because she prayed, opened mine eyes that I, not we, but I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Every time you pray that prayer, God will touch you. God will transform you. And God will give you new understanding, higher understanding in the word of God. Galatians, Galatians chapter 4. I'm reading here from verse 19. Galatians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Look at the Galatian believers. They had received the Lord as their personal savior. And according to the passage we are studying tonight, they got the first touch that saved them, that made them to know Christ is savior and Christ is Lord. But since that first experience of salvation, of transformation, this is their first touch. They have not gone back again to the Lord. And some Judaizers were coming to them. And their vision of Christ as the only Savior. Their vision of Christ as the only Son of God. The vision of Christ as the one that has offered the perfect sacrifice. Their vision of Christ as the sufficient Saviors was getting dim. And then Paul the Apostle saw them. Although he knew that they were saved before. He knew that their eyes had opened before. He knew they had got the first torch of salvation before. When he saw them, now he said, my little children, they're still children. Not that they are not totally backsliding. They have not gone away, but their eyes were now dim. He says, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. That was the second touch that he wanted them to have. And you are going to have your own. Amen. I will have my own. I said, I will have my own. The Lord will touch every one of us in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 9. Look at this, verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged, from his old sins. You see, there are people, they got the first touch. And now they just go on every day. No Bible study every day. There's no Sunday worship every day. There's no special reading of the word of God every day. They're all too busy. They rise so early in the morning. And then they rush to take the bus. And they go to the place of work. And while they're coming back, they hold up it so much. By the time they get back home, they cook. And then they're so tired, they sleep. And it happens every day like that, every day like that. Until they are forgetting that they are being cleansed from their old sins. Until the effect of the first touch is waning and is being robbed of them. Look at that verse 9 again. 
He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, wherefore the rather, brethren, the brethren, the children of God, they've got the first touch. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Amen. You will not fall. But must understand, go back to Christ, have the second touch. Go back to Christ, have another touch. Go back to Christ, have another illumination, another transformation. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly. Amen. When you get to heaven, the doors will abundantly open wide unto you. Amen. You will go with abundant joy, Amen. abundant strength abundant knowledge abundant confidence you will know it's not just that you're sneaking into heaven i hope i get there i hope i'm able to wangle my way and then i get there but the doors will be abundantly open unto you you see that that's the essence of not having another touch you come back to the lord and you have a different touch another touch it says for so an entrance shall be a minister unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our lord and savior jesus christ that's why it says look at verse 12 wherefore i will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance i know you need a second touch i will not be negligent to put you in remembrance of these things though ye know them and be established in the present truth I pray that the second touch will not miss you. Amen. It will not miss me. Amen. I said it will not miss me. Amen. I see the love of God getting greater, deeper, higher in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 26. Mark chapter 8. Verse 26, in verse 25, he had said, Now I see every man clearly. In verse 26, and he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. That may surprise you, but I want you to understand. This is a person who had been blind all his life. This is a person who had not seen any good thing, any bad thing. This is a person who does not know uh, the criminal shrine in that town. And he did not know all the dirty places in that place. And all those neighbors, there are people, they knew he had been blind. And Jesus said, don't mix with them now. You are just seen. And you don't know anywhere. Don't allow the evil people and the wicked people and the dirty people to see that you have received your sight now and you say, wonderful, you got your sight. Come, come, come. I'm going to, you have missed a lot. You know, this one they call dancing hall. This one they call idol worship a shine. This one they call this and that. This where they smoke and this where they commit crime. And this, he didn't want him to, to a kind of have any communion with all those bad people. Not now, but go back home. If you're going to see anything at all, See something good and see my word and meditate on what you saw. You saw my face and you saw my style and you saw everything I've done. Keep on meditating on that. When you are strong, then you can come to the town and people will not lead you here and there. The same thing was somebody who just got born again. Somebody who just got his sight open and somebody who just knew that now Christ is my savior and Christ is my Lord. If that person goes back, to the you know denominational churches traditional churches and the places where they teach them um, kind of um, evil things 
and they say they are doing follow up they will teach him tradition they will teach him religion they will teach him their hypocrisy and they will teach him their whatever they are teaching and Jesus said don't go there you don't go there yet now your eyes are open don't go to the places where you will be confused read the word get back to the word and get in communion fellowship with me so that when your eyes are so opened that no Pharisee can confuse you no Sadducee can confuse you then you can move anywhere in fact at that time now you become a preacher yourself and if they try to confuse say no that cannot be I know this is the word there will be no confusion in your life anymore no confusion in my life anymore I said no confusion in my life anymore the Lord will preserve you in that new light in that bright light and in that illumination he has given to your soul in Jesus name we'll come to point number two a convincing revelation of spiritual truth a convincing revelation of spiritual truth we're reading now from Mark chapter 8 and I'm reading from verse 27 Mark chapter 8 Verse 27, and Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked this, his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And he answered, John the Baptist. But some say, Elias, and others, one of the prophets. And he says unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and says unto him, Somebody help me say it aloud. Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man. He charged them that they should tell no man. Why? I thought we were to tell everybody. Yes, today we were to tell everybody. But you know, the Pharisees, they had had a conference together. And they had had conspiracy together. That if anybody should confess that Jesus Christ is the Christ, they will deal with him. Even Lazarus that was raised from the dead. And people went to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because of Lazarus that was raised from the dead. What were they planning to do? They were planning to kill him. They said, anyone that will confess and convince another person that this is the Christ, they're going to get rid of them. And Jesus needed his disciples to be alive. So that after he's gone, they are the people to take the gospel to every creature. So he said, don't endanger your life now. I know what those conspirators are thinking. And I know what they will do. Now you know, now you have confessed that I am the Christ. All right, hold that yourself at present. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And I'm reading from verse 13. It's the same story, but uh, Matthew gives us more details. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art. At John the Baptist, some Elias, some others Jeremiah, and one or one of the prophets. And he says unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, tell me, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Remember, when Jesus was being examined and was being tried, and the high priest said, okay, who do you say you are? And he didn't answer. And then he says, are you saying that you are the son of the highest? And Jesus said, thou says. And so the high priest said, everybody you have heard, he has blasphemed. And because he has blasphemed, he must be crucified. That's the reason why Jesus told his disciples, 
you will testify of me and you will say i am the christ the son of the living god but hold your peace at present so that you remain alive and you will not be killed because you are saying i am the christ and those pharisees will say you are blaspheming and then you will not be able to do what i give you to do but come back to verse 17 here and jesus answered and said unto him Blessed art thou, Simon, but Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. That convincing testimony he gave, that convincing revelation he gave, was a spiritual truth that was revealed to him by the Almighty God himself. Uh, look at Psalm 2. I'm reading from verse uh, 7. Psalm 2. Let's read from verse... Let, let's back up to verse 6. Psalm 2. We're reading from verse 6. And see what had been written. It says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. No problem. The Jews knew that somebody was coming. And that he'll be called the son of God. But their problem was to say that Jesus of Nazareth is the one that has come and has fulfilled that. That's what he didn't understand. And that's why Nathaniel said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, come and see. And when he came and he saw, he was convinced. Tonight you are convinced. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. That is Jesus of Nazareth. That came and he fulfilled that. Which we have read now in Psalm 2. That understanding was given by the almighty God. That understanding was revelation of the Lord himself. Look at verse 45. In verse 45. Philip findeth Nathaniel. And says unto him, We found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip says unto him, Tell me. Don't argue, just tell them, Come and see. And don't begin to tell them uh, your church is bad, your local assembly is bad, you don't see anything, don't understand, don't argue, don't argue. Tell them, what do you tell them? Mercy. Tell me, tell me. Mercy. Tell me, and like you are going to tell your neighbor. Mercy. Come and see. And when they come, uh, they will see. Yeah. They'll see miracle, yeah. they'll see transformation. They'll see the power of God touching them in Jesus' name. Look at verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and says unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no girl. Nathanael says unto him, unto Jesus, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, before the Philip called thee. When thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, What did he say? Rabbi, tell me. He said, Teacher, Master, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. You see that revelation? They arch the revelation. And I pray that you will have the revelation too. But you know, God must reveal that to you. 
If God does not reveal, people will not know. They'll be arguing. Uh, we, we believe that Jesus was a great prophet. We believe that Jesus was a great teacher. We believe that God was uh, Jesus was a perfect person. He lived a good life, a perfect life, a righteous life. But to say that Jesus is the Son of God, uh -uh, that one they don't accept. Look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 25. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. It's revelation that comes from God. When we know that Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus is the only Savior, and Jesus is the only Redeemer, is the Father in heaven, who has revealed this unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed, it seemed good in thy sight. Look at verse 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father except save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him is by revelation. And I pray that that revelation will come to your heart. Yeah. You'll not miss the revelation. Yeah. The touch of the Lord will come in the eyes of your mind. And the eyes of your mind will be opened in Jesus' name. Yeah. Acts chapter 9. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 17. I'm reading about a man who was a great a great persecutor, a great argumentator, a great contender, a person that even held the clothes of the people that were going to stone Stephen until they stoned him to death on the ground that Stephen spoke about Jesus as the Son of God and as the only Savior. But look at this, now something happened. A torch came and his blind eyes were opened. The torch of God is coming upon your life. Yeah. And all dimness is going to be taken away. And all blindness is going to be taken away. And the darkness of ignorance and the darkness of unbelief will be taken away from you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Let's come to Acts chapter 9 verse 17. And Ananias went his way. And he entered into the house. And putting his hands on him said... Brother Saul, think about that. Brother Saul, even Ananas himself, his eyes had been opened. Because when God said, go to him, he's in this street, and in that street he said, what? That man is in Julius. That man is a killer. That man is a persecutor. And he came over here, and he has letters of authority, and he's going to bind everyone that he finds in this way. And God said, no, he's born again. No, he's not regenerated. No, his eyes had been opened. And the eyes of Ananas himself was open. And he called him Brother Saul. The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, as sent me that thou mightest receive, tell me, tell me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith. And you received your own sight forthwith. Yeah. And arose and he was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Look at this, look at this. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that say it now. Say it like he said it. 
that he is the son of God. The man who was arguing before, and the man who said, I'll never believe that. And he came to Damascus to arrest and to imprison the people that believe that Jesus is the son of God. His eyes were now opened. What you didn't know before you came to the Bible study tonight, you have known. Amen. Your eyes are open. And the ignorance of the past, all that ignorance is gone in Jesus' name. And as you believe in your heart of heart that Jesus is the Son of God and He's your Savior, He's a sufficient Redeemer tonight. If you were not saved before tonight, you are saved in Jesus' name. And if you were saved before tonight, a second touch comes upon your life in Jesus' name. Hey, look at First John chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 15. First John chapter 4, we're looking at verse 15. It says in verse 15, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Will you allow him to open your eyes and you say, yes, I believe. That's my Savior. And it's sufficient as my Savior. Yes, I believe. He is the very Son of God and he died for me. He is the Son of God and I give all my attention, all my affection, all my trust, all my confidence, all my faith unto him. That work will be done in your heart. First John chapter 5 verse 20. First John chapter 5 verse 20. And we know that the Son of God is come. And I know, and I know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. Even in his Son, Jesus Christ. Even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Let's come back now to Mark chapter 8. We're coming to point number 3 now. Mark chapter 8. We're reading from verse 31. Mark chapter 8. Reading from verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again and he speak that sin openly but peter took him and began to rebuke him and when he had turned about he looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, tell me, get thee behind me, Satan. What happened here? Peter lent his mind unto Satan. And Satan was in disagreement with Christ. And Peter, who had confessed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, he went to the side of Satan, to discourage Christ, to contradict Christ, and to argue with Christ, and to oppose Christ, and to say, no, you will not go to the cross. No, you will not die for humanity. No, you will not be the savior of the world, but you will be our provider. You will be our healer. You will be our supplier. You will be our friend. You will be our teacher. We twelve, we your disciples, we need you. You cannot go to the cross. You cannot die and you cannot save thousands in Israel, millions outside Israel. Stay here with us. Now you see, his eyes had been touched and he saw Christ in a limited way. He needed a second touch so that he will know Christ 
has to die for the sins of the whole world so that many people all over the world at that time, until this time, until Christ will come, that they will come to the Lord. That's why Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou severest not, thou knowest not, thou cherishest not, thou hast no affection for the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. He was saved but was not in total agreement with Christ. And two cannot walk together except they be agreed. And so since he wasn't totally in agreement with Christ, Christ saw what he didn't see. And Christ saw what he didn't want to see. Although he saw Christ dimly, he did not see Christ to perfection. Look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, I'm reading here from verse 44. Luke chapter 9, we're reading from verse 44. Look at this. In verse 44, it says, Let this say sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. He repeated it again. Look at this, verse 45. But he understood not the same. And it was hid from them that they perceived it not. And they feared to ask him of that same. He repeated it again that he will die. He'll die for the sins of humanity. And that's exactly why he came. Uh, Daniel had spoken about that sacrifice. Isaiah had spoken about that sacrifice. And Jesus said, I'm going to fulfill that prophecy. I'll be crucified. I'll be killed. I will bear the sins of many and bring many people unto myself. He told them they didn't understand. They didn't ask any question. They didn't want to understand. They just disagreed. Their eyes needed to be opened afresh. A second touch spiritually. And there are things to read in the word of God about Christ. And there are things to read in the word of God about what Christ has said. And what he said he will do. And your mind is not there. And he's saying, I am coming again. I'm coming again. And there are some believers, their hearts have not been touched. Yes, I know it's coming, but let me finish this business. I know it's coming, but let me finish this project. I know he will come, but let me get married. I know he will come, but you know, I don't have any child here. Let me have my own child. I know he will come. Let me finish my education. I know it will come. Let me do this. They're not in agreement with Christ. And they're, they're going about, I want to do this. I want to grant this. I want to grab this. Because they cannot see. As Christ is seen, a second touch, your eyes will be opened our eyes will be open and you know sometimes god wants to do something and yet if the church cannot see we don't understand we'll say i'm saved i'm sanctified filled with the holy ghost and yet god wants to do something and we can't see and it's like abraham abraham had gone to sacrifice isaac because he had the word of the lord the lord had said this is what to do and he took his son and then he was going and then as they were going Isaac asked my father my father here is the wood here is the fire where is the sacrifice and Abraham said God will provide himself a sacrifice the lamb and he got there and he said the wood and he lay at sick down and then he stretched out the knife some people want to hear go they don't hear come once they hear kill they don't hear stop once they hear sacrifice him to me they don't hear the second voice that come that comes they don't see the second sign that comes but then the voice came abraham abraham 
He said, here am I, Lord, lay not your hand upon that child. And Abraham did not say, ah, ah, whatever I've heard is what I've heard. The first uh, voice, that's what I know. The second voice, I don't know. If you're spiritual, you must understand. He touched you the first time. He wants to touch you the second time. He spoke to you the first time. He wants to speak to you the second time. I pray you'll not miss the second touch. You will not miss the second voice. We're looking at uh, chapter 18 of Luke. Luke chapter 18. And I'm reading here from verse 31. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the toil and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and despitefully entreated and spitted upon and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Verse 34, tell me, verse 34. And he understood none of these things. Hey, do you understand? There are people that come to the Bible study. There's something they want to hear. And so some people even read the passage uh, we're studying before we come to the Bible study. And they're thinking, uh, this is what it means, this is what it means, and that's what it means. And now God begins to expand, expound and reveal unto us, wanting to touch us the second time, so we can understand that this is what he has in mind. In verse 34, and they understood none of these things, and the sin was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken, and they remained ignorant. I will not remain ignorant. The Lord will give us better understanding. Amen. Give us greater understanding. Amen. It will touch us afresh. It will open our eyes afresh. And we will see what he wants us to see in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And I'm reading from verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He said, they were slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them. He expounded unto them. Look up here, you might think, he stayed with us three years. He was with us three and a half years. And we heard everything. And he expanded the word of God unto us. Publicly and privately, he told us everything. There's nothing else to know. There are some people that think like that. They say, I've been in deeper life now for all these many years. And whatever, what are we reading in our gospel according to St. Mark or according to St. Matthew. According to St. John, or we're reading Acts of the Apostles, we learned that before, we knew that before, and therefore they will not come. They think they have known each all. Thank God for those who are here. Thank God for those who are listening. God knows the passion, the desire, and the hunger of your heart. You will not be disappointed in Jesus' name. <clears throat> and so we're told and begin at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, expounded to them, expounded to them. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, and he said unto them, these are the words which I speak unto you. While I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me, then, tell me, tell me, it will open your understanding. Then opened he the understanding, that they might understand 
the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Actually, he told them before, look at John chapter 16, John chapter 16, I'm reading from verses 12 and 13, John chapter 16, we're reading from verse 12 to verse 13. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. I've touched you. I've opened your eyes. It was your life then. And yet, even, after, even though I've taught you a lot of things, I have yet many things to say unto you, which you cannot bear yet. It says in verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Amen. He will guide you into all truth. Amen. The second touch will come. Amen. The second illumination will come. Amen. And the second opening of your eyes will come. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you. He will show you what you have never known. He will show you things to come. Uh, what, what did we say about Peter? Peter did not have the mind of Christ. He had salvation. He was born again. He even said, you are the son of the living God. But something was missing. He didn't have the mind of Christ. If he had the mind of Christ, the message of Christ will be in his heart. The revelation of Christ will be in his heart. And the very fact that Jesus said, I'm going away and I'm going to die. I'll die for the sins of humanity and I will rise again. He'll say, yes, we know. We agree with you. I'm of the same mind with you. And there are many people people who have not got the totality of the revelation of the mind of Christ when he touches us again tonight he'll impart unto us the mind of Christ in Jesus name look at Philippians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 3 Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 let nothing be done through strife of vain glory but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Look not every man on his own things. What was Peter looking at? He, he calms the sea. He heals the sick. I remember he healed my mother-in-law. When they were in the house of Simon Peter, and now he says he's going to be killed. If he's going to be killed, and he goes away, what happens then to my mother-in-law? What happens to my wife? What happens to our people? If anybody gets sick, if this happens, if that happens, he wants us not just to be thinking of ourselves. Christ was thinking of the salvation of the whole world, of the salvation of humanity. There are people that think only of their local circle, their local church, and their local understanding, and their local need. And they're not thinking of the broader, and the wider, and the higher, and the deeper deeper need of the whole of humanity. He says, let him touch you again and give you the mind of Christ so that you will look beyond your little circle. Look at verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. When he touches us the second time, that mind mind will be in us. Amen. The mind of Christ. Amen. The will of Christ. Amen. And the purpose of Christ. Amen. Look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. After we are saved, we need a second touch, sanctification. And it's at that point of sanctification, he gives us his very mind. Look at uh, verse 15, 16, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us for 
after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds, in their minds will I write them. That had not been done for Peter. Therefore, he didn't understand. And when Jesus said, I will die, and give my life as a ransom for the whole of humanity on the third day, I will rise again. That wasn't on his mind. What on his mind was that, yeah, okay, the way you are, stay with us, you are the son of God, and you are the savior, you are the provider for everything that we need. Don't say you are going to die, don't say you are going to be buried, don't say you are going to rise the third day, that will never happen to you. The word had not been written in his mind. The will had not been written in his mind. There are people who say they are saved and thank God they are saved and thank God they are born again. But the word of God, the mind of God had not been perfected in them. But a second touch is coming. I said the second touch is coming. Uh, look at uh, First Thessalonians. I'm reading from chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 10. First Thessalonians chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 10. Something interesting here. Very important here. In First Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse 10. Night and day. Praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Paul, the apostle said, Thessalonians, I thank God for you. You've got the first touch. I thank God for you. You're born again. I thank God for you. New life has come to you. But you know, Thessalonians, I want to come to you. Why are you coming? To perfect that which is lacking in your faith. What does that mean? Look at chapter 1, verse 3. Chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 3. It says in chapter 1, verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, they had faith already. They were born again already. The faith that saves had been in them. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Savior. And now in chapter, chapter 3 it says, I am coming to you so that I will perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Let's see what follows after that coming to them. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're looking at verse 3. We're bound to thank God always for you. Brethren, as it is meet, because your faith, tell me, grows exceedingly. In chapter 3, it said, I'll come to perfect your faith. You need a second touch. You need a second opening of your eyes. And you need a second transformation in your mind. In chapter 1, he acknowledged your faith. He acknowledged, he even demonstrated the work of faith. And as he comes to 2 Thessalonians, he said, what I said I will do to perfect your faith, the second touch has come and your faith grows exceedingly. And the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounds. The Lord will do it. Amen. You'll have a second touch. You'll have a second benefit. You'll have a second blessing. Whatever you had before, there's going to be a reproduction. There's going to be a multiplication. There's going to be a brightening up. That's all the amen my people can give. Look at 2 Corinthians now. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 15, I'm waiting for you. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15. And in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before. That ye might have, tell me, 
that she might have say it again that she might have say it aloud the second benefit they add the first benefit they add the first touch but now he said that's not all you need something more tonight i need something more your eyes need something more your mind needs something more. Your heart needs something more. Your Christian experience needs something more. And God is going to touch you again. And in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before that ye might have a second benefit. Somebody is waiting for a second touch. Somebody is waiting for a second transformation. Somebody is waiting for a second benefit. You must not go until something happens again in your heart, in your life, in your mind, in your experience tonight. In Jesus' name. Let's rise up now. Let's rise up now. Second benefit, second benefit, second touch, and second transformation, and second performance. It will do it. Don't allow the Bible study to just get over uh, your mind or get over your head or just to run over your shoulders. Pray and open your mouth to them and say, Oh Lord, second benefit, second touch, and second transformation. This is what the Lord has taught us today. The necessity of the second touch. Let it happen.